Um, hello and welcome. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Katie Weiland. I'm the director of middle and high school ministry here at Zion. Um, and I'm also a student at Luther Seminary. I'm in my second year pursuing a Master's of Divinity um, with the hopes of someday becoming a pastor myself. Um, so as Mary uh, mentioned, the adult forum today uh, will be talking, or I'll be talking about the ideal woman. And the I initial idea for today's forum came about um, in my win winter course, Gender, Sex, and the Old Testament at school. Um, for my final project for this course, we had the opportunity to either write a paper or do the un-essay. And I was like, un-essay, that sounds interesting. I'll do an adult forum <laughs> or something, a project that would uh, go with this medium. So today, it's kind of a lecture, kind of a discussion. We'll have large group and small group discussion. Um, but the focus is looking at the ideal woman and how the ideal woman has changed um, throughout the generations and also looking specifically at the um, biblical text from Proverbs is going to be our focus uh, for this session. Um, and this is just a tiny dip into a huge pool. Like we did a whole course on gender, sex in the Old Testament and we could have done multiple courses, you know. So this is just kind of a tiny snippet of all that uh, could be said in this kind of study. Gender presentation. Gender is a uh, social construct. To discuss what it means to be a woman, I think we need to start by discussing the fact that gender is socially constructed. It's an idea created by people to help us organize and categorize the world around us. There are certain expectations that come along with each gender. When a woman is pregnant or discovers that she is having a little girl, what sort of things might you buy, bring to that baby shower if it's a little girl? Would they be the same if you're going to a baby shower for a little boy? They might be different, they might be the same, it kind of depends. Um, but typically if it's a girl baby shower, there may be some pink onesies or pink balloons. Um, maybe you'd be getting dolls and frilly outfits, whereas a boy, you maybe have the blues, the blue onesies and trucks and footballs or bow ties or something. Um, so in our culture, we have a very defined way that people express their gender. Um, and these start at a young age. So I want you to pause and think for a moment. Um, think about yourself and when you were getting ready this morning. How did you fix your hair? How did you choose what clothes to put on? Did you put on makeup today? And beyond that, do you drive a certain kind of car? Are there, um, you know, all sorts of things can contribute to gender presentation. Like today, I'm wearing a dress. That is showing my gender. I also have really short hair, um, but maybe is not as typical for a woman, but it is, I would say, still a feminine haircut. So it's just all to point out that there are ways that we present our gender, and we're all doing it whether you're aware of it or not. From the Trevor Project, this is a quote, gender is a social construct, an idea created by people to help categorize and explain the world around them. You may not notice it all the time, but each gender comes with a set of expectations like how to act, talk, dress, feel emotion, and interact with other people. So even just looking through the decades, I pulled a few pictures here. Anyone have a guess what era the first one on the left is from? Can you see what they're doing? Yeah, they're doing war stuff. Yes, war stuff. World War II. World War II. And then next in the middle, what <laughs> era is she? Yeah, 50s. 50s. 50s housewife. Yep. And any guesses on the far right? It's the 90s. 90s. Yep. 80s, 90s. Got the businesswoman. Um, so just I want you to turn to the people at your table and talk about what were the ideas for women um, in the workplace when you were growing up? Have they changed throughout your life? What are the kind of ideas uh, for women in the workplace now? If you want to wrap up your discussions, I'll bring us back. Um, I just wanted to show a quick video to illustrate um, just how s the physical appearance of the ideal woman has changed over the generations. 
Um, and then this video is obviously kind of a generalization, like some of these outfits to represent the different um, decades are definitely stereotypes. I'm not suggesting that this is the only way women dressed in each period, but it is kind of a fun thing to look through. Um, and I wanted to uh, share with you Emma McClendon, the Associate Curator of Costume at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York, was quoted saying, people come and always want to know the size something is. Whether it's contemporary or 19th century, they want to know what size it is or what size it would correlate to or what measurement it is. We as a culture, as a society, are obsessed with size. It's become connected to our identity as people. Um, so this to say we cannot deny that a part of being a woman comes with pressure to look a certain way, just like there are certain jobs that are more acceptable or maybe not acceptable for a woman to hold, as I'm sure you all discussed at your tables. Um, and this gets to our values as a society. So I will pull up the video. Yes, generalizations, um, but it still goes to show that there is a wide variety of what um, is ideally fashionable or um, acceptable for a woman um, across, you know, even just recent decades here in the United States. Um, so before we get to the Bible preview or uh, Spoiler alert, that's where we're going next. <laughs> um, before we get there, I want you to turn to your table again and have a little discussion about what societal values you think are linked to being a woman, um, common attributes, like what does an ideal woman look like in society today? And then in the back of your mind, I want you to be thinking about, are these gonna be the same as the societal values for women in biblical times? So go ahead. I'm going to interrupt your discussions. Uh, I'm going to read the scripture again for us one more time. This is something we do in seminary all the time. You can't just listen to it once. You've got to listen to it three, four, whatever times. We're just going to listen to it twice today, though. So as I read it again, see if anything new stands out to you about this woman, about who she is and how she acts. Um, and then I'll bring us back for more small group discussions before we move on. So see if anything new stands out to you in the second reading. A woman of strength who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and tasks for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands on the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid for her household when it snows, for all her household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the lands. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchants with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. 
She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy, her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the city gates. So you have a second round of questions, part two questions. Um, you can also talk about part one questions, whatever. Um, but discuss amongst yourselves once again. I'm gonna take us back, reel us back in. Thank you for your lovely discussion. I hate to break that up, but um, we have more. <laughs> so I wanted to just draw on a contemporary media comparison to Proverbs 31. Um, have any of you seen the Barbie movie, the big blockbuster of last year? Okay, if you have not, um, the speech that we're about to watch um, is given by the actress America Ferreira um, to uh, Margot Robbie's character, and Margot is Barbie. I mean, they're kind of all Barbies, but um, America's, not. America's not. She's a human. Anyhow, <laughs> Barbie is kind of having a little mental breakdown, and then this speech kind of riles her up, and she's like, no, it's okay. Um, so we're going to watch that and then talk about how this might compare to what we have just read in Proverbs 31. It is literally impossible to be a woman. You are so beautiful and so smart, and it kills me that you don't think you're good enough. Like, we have to always be extraordinary, but somehow we're always doing it wrong. <laughs> like you have to be thin, but not too thin. And you can never say you wanna be thin. You have to say you wanna be healthy, but also you have to be thin. You have to have money, but you can't ask for money because that's crass. You have to be a boss, but you can't be mean. You have to lead, but you can't squash other people's ideas. You're supposed to love being a mother, but don't talk about your kids all the damn time. You have to be a career woman, but also always be looking out for other people. You have to answer for men's bad behavior, which is insane, but if you point that out, you're accused of complaining. You're supposed to stay pretty for men, but not so pretty that you tempt them too much or that you threaten other women because you're supposed to be a part of the sisterhood, but always stand out and always be grateful. But never forget that the system is rigged, so find a way to acknowledge that, but also always be grateful. You have to never get old, never be rude, never show off, never be selfish, never fall down, never fail, never show fear, never get out of line. It's too hard, it's too contradictory, and nobody gives you a medal or says thank you. And it turns out, in fact, that not only are you doing everything wrong, but also everything is your fault. I'm just so tired of watching myself and every single other woman tie herself into knots so that people will like us. And if all of that is also true for a doll, just representing a woman, then I don't even know. So yes, consult those last two questions on your sheet, um, and then we'll come back. I'll ask you to come back one last time, finish up your discussions. So when I initially turned in this project uh, at the end of our winter term, my professor said, you know, good job, Katie. However, you might consider that this is too long of a presentation. <laughs> and um, that is because, ideally, we would do two more studies looking at scripture. But 
we don't have time for that. I would just invite you that if this is interesting to you and you would like to um, contemplate more on this, to look at the stories both of Hannah, um, which is in 1 Samuel chapter 1, Hannah's story, and also Bathsheba, which can be found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Um, two, I think, pretty iconic women in the Old Testament, um, or at least their stories are, um, vastly different. So if you're looking and reading these Bible stories, be thinking about um, what does this story say about being a woman? How are these women depicted? And then maybe you could compare and contrast between the two. Um, there are so many women that you could look at in the Old Testament. You could look at Ruth, you could look at Esther, you could look at Eve. Um, but I think, I don't know, for my assignment, if you want it, Hannah and Bathsheba, I think are interesting to look at in contrast to each other. Um, so as we conclude today's lecture, I simply invite you to ponder the question, what does it mean to be a woman? A biblical woman, a contemporary woman, a Christian woman? It's a loaded question, um, and I think one that we might all have a little bit of a different answer to, and that's okay. Perhaps what makes womanhood so wonderful, complex, uh, liberating, but also oppressive is that fact that we could all have a different answer to this question. Um, I hope I've provoked some thoughts and ideas within you that you maybe hadn't considered before um, on the ideal woman. And I hope that you can share this with other people, um, perhaps someone in a different generation than you, knowing what you went through in your lifetime and what made being a woman difficult or maybe not so difficult. How can we shape the lives of our children, our teens, our um, young adults, and how do we want the future to look like for them? Uh, also, the world is not just women. <laughs> There's men too, and men also have these same kind of um, struggles. It would maybe look different, but um, again, if I had more time, we would maybe look at some biblical men and see how they are characterized and stereotyped and how their position has changed over um, the 20th and 21st century and also what it was like in biblical times. Um, but that's um, someday in the future we can perhaps do that. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>